Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see everyone today. Good to have visitors with us as well. Give you a warm welcome. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I'd like us to turn, please, to the book of Acts and chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're continuing our journey uh, through the book of Acts. I want to read uh, verses 1 through 15 this morning. And I want to think about differing attitudes towards the word of God. So we begin in verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, uh, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consulted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain rude fellows of the base sort and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary, to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city. And when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews." There were, th these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also, and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving commandment unto Silas and Timotheus were to come to him with all speed, they departed. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word. If you remember, uh, in uh, the what we call the parable of the sower, Matthew 13. Although it's probably more accurate to call it the parable of the soils, because really uh, the sower, of course, uh, uh, sows the same seed on each occasion. And it's good seed. It's the word of God. What's different is the soil which the seed falls upon. And there are different types of soil, and there are different types of results, aren't there, from the sowing of the good seed of the Word of God. Some of the ground that's already prepared and ready turns out to be very fruitful. And as we've gone through the book of Acts, we've seen the good seed of the Word of God is being sown. And we've seen individuals that were prepared. We thought of Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened. She was ready. She received the word of God and became fruitful immediately. Her home opened to the gospel. We've seen Cornelius earlier on. Again, a man who's definitely seeking and heart was open. Uh, but we've also seen others that were resistant to the message. When we come to this chapter, what Luke is doing is simply, uh, in a sense, putting side by side two locations Thessalonica and Berea, and showing us two different responses, particularly amongst the Jews. In Thessalonica, the vast majority of them rejected the message. The soil, if you like, was hard. It was hard-packed. It wasn't responsive. 
And not only did they not receive it themselves, when they heard that those at Berea, they had a very different attitude. They searched the scriptures. They said, see these things themselves. And a great number of that Jews believed there. And when they, those in Thessalonica heard it, they went to try and, as it were, put an end to this nonsense and stop it as quickly as they could. And so it's all down to how we respond to the word of God. And of course, it's good to ask ourselves the question, even though uh, perhaps most of us here are believers this morning. But, you know, constantly, we really have to ask the question, how receptive am I to the word of God? It's interesting that one of the things the Lord Jesus said in Luke 8, 18, he said this, take heed, therefore, how you hear. Isn't that interesting? In other words, we need to take great care how we hear. Are we really, do we have, really have ears to hear? He'll say that to the churches in, in Revelation, won't he? Uh, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. And the implication is that there are some people who just don't have ears to hear. They're not receptive. Uh, maybe they've got a bias. Maybe they've got a prejudice. They just don't want to hear what that message is. But it's good to ask ourselves, how receptive are we to what God might say to us even this morning? And so as we consider this, uh, it's very easy to divide up verses 1 through 9 is Thessalonica and their response to the word of God. And verses 10 down to verse 15, we will see Berea and their response to the word of God. But let's begin the journey. It says, I want you to notice verse 1. It says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. First thing we want to think about is this. Why did they pass through Amphipolis and Apollonia? Were there not souls there that needed to hear the gospel? Why did they go to Thessalonica? Why did they just pass by those other places? Uh, is there some kind of strategy here in Paul's thinking? And I want to suggest to you that he's very strategic. Two things. We don't know that there was a synagogue in either one of those places. But we do know for sure that there was a large synagogue in Thessalonica. That's the Auckland where Paul went first, to the Jew first, because he's already going to get a ready hearing. In, in fact, we know that actually Thessalonica, uh, is, uh, there's a place today called Salonica in Greece, same place, a uh, port city. And uh, up to the Second World War, there was always a large Jewish population in Salonica. In fact, it reached a climax of 200,000 Jews prior to the Second World War. Tragically, those 200,000 Jews ended up in the Holocaust. They all died. They're not there now. They're gone. But, so there's always been a Jewish population there. So, so that's part of the reason. There's strategic thinking in Paul. He, he, not only that, he goes to the, the main hubs, the main cities. He, he can't be everywhere. And so he's been strategic in the place he picks because you know, they, they, it's on the Ignatian Way. It's one of the main highways through the Roman Empire. And so people would come into Thessalonica. It's a port city. They'd go out of Thessalonica because it's a port city. If they could get a, as it were, a beachhead for the gospel in Thessalonica, from there, the word of God could go to other places. When we read First Thessalonians, we'll read that what that's exactly what happened. From them, the word of the Lord sounded out, trumpeted out, so we don't have to say anything. It's not only gone around the province, but to Macedonia and Achaia as well, a surrounding province. The word of God went out from there, so there's definitely a strategic thinking in Paul's mind. And of course, he, uh, it's a hundred-mile journey between Philippi and Thessalonica, and uh, they most likely uh, traveled uh, up to 30 miles per day. Now, I just want you to think about this because what had happened in Philippi before they went to Thessalonica? And the reason people think three days is because it would take a day to get to uh, their first location, a day to get to the second one, and the third day would take them to Thessalonica. And so, 330 day, uh, 30 miles per day journeys. But remember, they had just come from Philippi where they had been beaten with rods. <laughs> Put in the inner prison, in stocks, bleeding backs. Now, think about it today. If you were a missionary today, and you had been beaten with rods, put in an inner prison, and uh, uh, I suspect that you would take a furlough, and you would book uh, sessions with a psychiatrist to deal with your PTSD. 
That's how contemporary people would deal with this. But these men were soldiers of the cross. They were followers of the Lamb. They did not want to be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease. So they just get up and go to the next destination. That's a challenge to us, isn't it? We are so soft. Lord, we need help because I, things are kind of get, heating up a little bit. Uh, we can see in uh, popularity of Christianity is diminishing in the West, as it were. The sun is setting on the West, it would seem. And uh, we may not be popular for much longer. And so we need to, as it were, fortify ourselves because this could be what we face in days ahead. And, and so, Lord, help us to have more resilience and to be more robust as believers in Christ and not to be so wimpy. <laughs> Uh, and of course, what comes down to witnessing, that's often uh, where we are the biggest chickens, isn't it? Sharing our faith with others. Lord, help us to overcome fear of man. Fear of what man can do to us. Eternal souls are at stake here. And so it tells us that he goes uh, through these places and ends up in Thessalonica, where it says was a synagogue of the Jews. And of course, we said that provides an excellent point of contact with people who already had a familiarity with the Old Testament scriptures. So they already know two-thirds of the story. All, all they need is the rest of the story, right? That's all they need. And so a great place to begin. And it, it is easy when you've got somebody that already has a base of, of understanding. Very difficult when you deal with people who don't know anything. Where do you even begin? Now, we're going to see when he gets to Athens, he's dealing with people who don't know anything. He's got to come at a different starting point than the scriptures because he's dealing with the people who know very little. But here, this synagogue provided a glorious opportunity. And although he is the apostle to the Gentiles, he always goes to the Jew first. And part of the reason was, and I think we've already mentioned this in the past, but there was a great disillusionment in the pagan world. People were really disillusioned with the bankruptcy of paganism and so many pagans were actually attending synagogues they weren't full proselyte jews but they were what we call god fearers men like cornelius right he was a god fearer and uh, uh, this would be an example in thessalonica we're going to see the ones that responded uh, were actually gentiles but they were already part way there they were already sick and tired of the failure and bankruptcy of paganism, and they're already coming to the synagogue for answers. And so notice it says that as he went there, it says, verse 2, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now, some have deduced that because it says that he reasoned with them out of the scriptures for three Sabbath days, that Paul was only there for three weeks. And of course, even Schofield in his notes says Paul was just there for three weeks. Now, who am I to disagree with Mr. Schofield? I mean, I don't, I'm going to be careful here. I don't want to do that, but, but I have to disagree. And the reason I disagree is I believe that he was three weeks in the synagogue, and afterwards, when he was basically rejected by the synagogue, he went outside there and began to preach to the Gentiles. We're going to explain why that is the reason. Now, again, he wasn't there long. He still had to leave prematurely, but he would have rather stayed longer because of Jason and the bond and all the rest of it. But he was there more than three weeks. How do we know that? I want you to look with me, please, for a second in Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 4. And verse 16, where we read this, well, sorry, verse 15, it says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again, unto my necessity. 
And you see that? So while Paul was in Thessalonica, the Christians in Philippi had sent a love gift to the Apostle Paul to help him in his labors once and again. So at least two love gifts. Now, it's not a case of, you know, kind of direct bank deposits. You know, you just kind of go online and uh, send Zelle or whatever. They, they didn't have that those days. They didn't even have a postal service in those days. So how did they get a gift to Paul again and again? Well, I mean, somebody from Philippi, in fact, we know who that somebody was, Epaphras, <laughs> went on a journey. And that journey, at least three days, 30 miles a day, and then, of course, takes the gift, comes back, and then goes back again a second time. Uh, I don't think that happens in three weeks. I suspect that uh, it was longer than three weeks, but Paul recognizes that they had received gifts uh, from them. Not just that, there's some more evidence you see, uh, what we find is that the converts in Thessalonica, um, as we, we look at First Thessalonians, and maybe if you've got a, a ribbon or a marker, uh, you might put it in First Thessalonians, uh, because we'll be looking back there uh, a couple of times, or looking forward there a couple of times, because the, there's great relevance here. But notice it, what he says in First Thessalonians chapter 1, and let me stick my ribbon in there so that I'm doing what I'm telling you to do. Uh, ch uh, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, For they themselves show unto of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So what we you see is that the vast majority of the converts in Thessalonica had actually turned to God from idols. So they're not the ones that were in the synagogue because they'd already done that before. But this is all preaching and the vast majority of them were out of a pagan background. Now, remember these ones that had come to the synagogue already, uh, they'd already left their idols behind. But this is through the preaching of Paul, turning to God from idols. And so it would seem that outside of there, perhaps from Jason's home, he continued the ministry, reaching out to Gentiles, and many of them were saved. In fact, interestingly enough, in First and Second Thessalonians, the, these marvelous letters, there's, there's only, at least a, I can think of one or maybe two allusions to the Old Testament in First and Second Thessalonians, but no direct reference. Because it's basically people saved out of a pagan background. And so uh, it's important to see that. But back again to Acts 17. And so it, three Sabbath days, and notice it says, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. <clears throat> again, the scriptures that he's reasoning from would be the Old Testament. And so he's using uh, passages, some of them that were read this morning at our remembrance meeting. Isaiah 53. Psalm 22, maybe Psalm 110, Psalm 16, all of these passages, and he's using them, these portions of scripture, he is reasoning with them. The idea of the word reasoning is the idea of, it's got the idea of dialogue involved, uh, some kind of exchange, questions and answers. He dialogued with them from the scriptures. And what is he trying to show from these scriptures? Notice he says he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus, whom I preach to you, is Christ. Now, again, some interesting words here, opening. The message that, that he gives is very simple. Only Jesus of Nazareth could possibly have fulfilled these scriptures. Nobody else could possibly fulfill them. And, and so he, he shows this in such a clear way. And the idea of opening is opening the scriptures with clarity and simplicity so they could get it. Uh, and of course, uh, where did they learn that? Well, let's look back at Luke's gospel, chapter 24. I'll tell you exactly where uh, that style was learned. It was learned from the master himself. In Luke 24, verse 32, we read this delightful verse. It says... Uh, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within, with, within us while he taught with us by the way 
and while he opened to us the scriptures. Isn't that wonderful? Open to us the scriptures. And that's what Paul's doing. He's opening up the scriptures so they can see it. By the way, that's what that's why we believe in expository preaching. Because what expository preaching is, is it's ex, the word ex is the idea of out of, right? Like exodus or exit. We're bringing out from the text that which is already there. We're expounding the word of God. That's opening the scriptures. And of course, we need to open the scriptures. Let people see what the word of God is really saying, what its implications are, what it means. Now, of course, uh, the opposite of, of exegesis, bringing out of the scriptures, uh, which is done through exposition, is eisegesis, which is reading into the text that which is not there. And lots of cultists and false teachers, that's all they do. They read into into the text, their own ideas and thoughts, rather than out from the text that which is already there. And so that, that's what our goal is, to bring out from the text. And so he opens the scriptures, and then it says opening and alleging. And this idea of alleging is demonstrating uh, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. He's giving evidence. He's Proving, he, he's, he's, the word literally has to be replaced beside or set before. He's presenting in a persuasive way the evidence that Jesus had to suffer like this, just as the scriptures had said, alleging Christ must need to suffer. And of course, uh, we think of it, the Lord Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Uh, just as Moses lifted up, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, right? So he's just showing Christ had to suffer uh, in order to fulfill the scriptures, in, in order that all of those scriptures like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 meet their fulfillment, Christ had to suffer. And so he says, uh, this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. And notice as he does this, how successful it is, at least with some, it says, notice, and some of them believed, that some of the Jews believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas. And then it says, and of the devout Greeks, okay, these are those Gentiles who have, have devoted themselves to the synagogue. Now, they're not proselytes. They haven't crossed that line yet. But, but they're, they're God-fearers. The devout Greeks are a great multitude. So there's a few Jews, and then the vast majority of them are those Greeks that are already disillusioned with paganism. They have believed, and then it's them, and the devout uh, uh, and the chief women, not a few. Uh, those uh, many believed to be wives of some of the leading men of the city, uh, people of influence, and they believe the word of God. Notice the response from the Jews. In verse 5, it says, But the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy. Isn't it amazing? Envy is such a powerful, powerful thing, isn't it? What were the envious of? Envy has the idea of begrudging someone else's success. There's a lot of begrudges. <laughs> Uh, and, and there are a lot of people out there that are begrudges. They begrudge what, uh, actually, the whole socialist mentality is based on begrudging the success of others, isn't it? And our culture is full of it right now, begrudging people's success. Don't like it when people do well. And, uh, and, and so, on a spiritual level, too, there's this begrudging success. Why? These Jews had been trying for a long time to convince these devout Greeks to take the full step and become proselytes. That includes baptism. They've been working hard at that. And this guy comes, and in three weeks, he succeeds. Where they have failed, maybe doing it for months and months and months, and here comes this one guy, three weeks, and then he gets tremendous results. Yeah, it bothers them. They don't like that at all. They resent his success. And so... <clears throat> Of course, we need to recognize, we don't hear it preached very often, but we need to tell it like it is. Look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, just for a moment. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. And I want to read from verse 34. Mark 10, verse 34. 
says this, and they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day uh, he shall rise again. <clears throat> and uh, it's not a scripture I'm looking for. What I'm thinking of is that the Lord Jesus said uh, that he came uh, not uh, to bring, uh, to, to divide family from family. And uh, certainly uh, we, we, we see that, uh, that the Lord Jesus brought division. And uh, certainly that's what's going on here. He is the dividing point of the human race. And so uh, th this group are now divided. There are those that have believed and those have rejected the message. And there's, there's now hostility between them. And I want to just say this. It's very important to recognize that all human divisions ultimately will pass away. Right? Right now, there's a lot of divisions in society. There's divisions on racial lines, on class lines, on uh, sexual lines. <laughs> there's division everywhere. That's all going to pass away someday. It's all going to be gone. But one di di division will continue into the entirety of eternity. What will that division be? It will be the human race divided on this ground. What did you do with Jesus Christ? Those that have accepted him will be with him for all eternity in heaven, enjoying worshipping the Lamb. All those others who reject him will also be together for all eternity in a place called the Lake of Fire. You see, he will divide the human race and it, uh, again, our society. Right now, we're divided. Again. All those divisions are going to pass. Ultimately, the one division that will continue throughout all eternity is what people do with the Savior of sinners. To reject him is to confine yourself forever in the lake of fire. To accept him is to be in unspeakable bliss throughout all eternity. And so he's the divider, the divider of the human race in every way, he came to divide. And so we notice it says, uh, those that were moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base assault and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring out the people. And so their envy caused them to stir up the mob. They, they didn't do the work themselves. But they found a rent a mob, uh, probably hanging around the marketplace with nothing better to do. Uh, you know, by the way, th there's nothing worse than idleness, right? I mean, uh, we, it was interesting. We were, I was in Victoria recently, beautiful, beautiful city. But downtown Victoria, because the climate is the best in Canada, there, there's a tent city down, downtown for all these people. And the government even pays for their dog vet bills. Can you believe this? I mean, and there are people who have nothing to do. They're just the kind of mob that you could easily get whipped up to be involved in these kind of riot things, right? And, and again, what, what people need is something to do. <laughs> Ideally, what should happen is uh, they should bring back military service and uh, have them doing some work or something. Now, that'll clear the streets pretty quickly. But either way, what we find is that they found this, this rent -a mob and were able to whip them up. And notice what happens. It says, the Jews which believed not move with them. We took unto them certain blue fellows with the base of saw, gathered a company, set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason. Now, now why assaulting the house of Jason? Well, the answer is very simple. This is where Paul and his companions were obviously lodging. It, it was the focal point. Now, it's really interesting as we go through Acts, but there's a lot of mention of those that gave the servants of God a sheltering place. We already saw Lydia, remember? Come to my house and stay, right? <laughs> you know, uh, she, she wanted them to stay with them. Uh, we see it here. We'll see it again in Acts 18, verse 3. It says, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them. That's Priscilla and Aquila. And, and wrote for their occupation, they were tent makers. Uh, we'll see it in chapter 21 and verse 16. 
<clears throat> it says, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Mason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And of course, we think of the Gospels. There's Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Their house was a place where the Lord himself went and found refreshment and rest. And even in the Old Testament, remember the, the story of the Shunammite woman and she you know she builds this kind of little kind of spare bedroom with the with with a table and a lamp for the servant of God to stay there every time he passed through and one thing that we can see is that in both testaments the word of God tells us that hospitality to God's people is a huge thing it really is in fact it tells us we should be addicted to hospitality uh, the home that you have has been given you for a purpose. It's not for your comfort. It's to forward the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we using our home for that purpose? Uh, I spend a lot of my life in other people's homes. In other people's beds. Amazing, really. The kindness of God's people is amazing. And how we thank God for that, but it's a really important thing. Now, just another thought on Jason. Again, I wouldn't be dogmatic on this, but some have suggested, if you look at Romans 16, some have suggested that actually he might well have been a kinsman of the Apostle Paul. Romans 16, verse 21, uh, just kind of a really interesting chapter. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Saucy Pater, my kinsmen salute you. <laughs> and so is it Jason and Saucy Peter who are his kinsmen that salute you? And so it could well be uh, that Jason was a kinsman of Paul, but in one sense, even if he wasn't, if he's a believer, and oftentimes, by the way, uh, you know, kind of interesting if you look at the history of assembly testimony in this country. And a lot of the pioneer evangelists would go to areas and they would find somebody who would take them in. They weren't necessarily believers, but they would, they would give them a place to lodge. And oftentimes, when the gospel was preached, the first household that got blessed were those that gave hospitality to the servants of God and became a basis for further evangelistic work. And, and so certainly uh, we can see this. And notice it, so again, as we go back to the passage, it says, and when they found them not, they threw Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now, maybe there's a little bit of an exaggeration in their statement, but it sure is a backhanded compliment, if ever there was one, isn't it? These people have turned the world upside down. The old Puritans used to say, actually, it might be better to say, they've turned the world the right way up. Amen. Because really, because of man's sin and rebellion, everything's out of kilter. Everything's wrong. Everything's upside down. It's not the way it ought to be. And the only thing that can put things right is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in a very real sense, uh, the gospel does indeed... Uh, cause magnificent, amazing changes to occur in people, in families, in marriages, in every situation. And so according to this mob, Jason had harbored these people who had turned the world upside down. So notice verse 7, it says, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Caesar. Now, it's very evident that Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was very eschatological. We get that from reading First and Second Thessalonians. Because in First and Second Thessalonians, he talks about the rapture. He talks about the man of sin. He talks about the day of the Lord. He, he, he talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus in flaming fire to execute judgment on those that, that obey not the gospel. I mean, it's, it's full of prophecy. And so quite evidently, he was talking about the Lord Jesus, a king who would come and reign in righteousness 
for a thousand years. And somehow the message had filtered out into the wider community. And people were talking about, hey, this guy's talking about another king called Jesus. And of course, they uh, that's the accusation that this is the threat to Caesar. It says that they, these do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Look back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. It says in verse 1, the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. It had worked once before. <laughs> this man's a threat, you see, he's a threat to Caesar. He's claiming that he's a king. And uh, so they use the same strategy. And, uh, of course, uh, this has been a similar accusation through the years that the Christians are seeking to overthrow a threat to the government. Many of the communist countries, Christianity is considered to be a huge threat to the government. They want to shut it down. It's a threat because, of course, it's a message of freedom. And, of course, people that bring people into bondage don't like messages that speak of freedom. It's a message of divided loyalties. You see, uh, these dictatorships, whether they're socialist or whether they're, uh, they're nationalistic, it doesn't make any difference. They want absolute loyalty to the state. And as a child of God, we have divided loyalties. Yeah, we're going to be good citizens. We're going to obey those that have the rule over us. We're going to be the best citizens, really, we could possibly be. But at the same time, we always acknowledge we have dual citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Once we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will change our vile bodies, they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And so that's not what they want. <laughs> they want your body and soul. They want complete, complete allegiance to their system. And we can't give that. And so we become a threat. And so, as a result of this, verse 8, it says, They troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So, <clears throat> they made Jason pay a security, what we would call a bond, some kind of uh, bail, bail bond uh, uh, payment. And basically as a guarantee that Paul and Silas would leave town and not return. That's how they operate. And so, when you go to 1 Thessalonians, remember I told you to keep your Bible marker in there. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. <clears throat> Paul says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. How did Satan hinder them? going back to Thessalonica. We wanted to come again and again. Satan put a roadblock, a stumbling block in front of us. What was the stumbling block? Paul shows up. What happens to Jason? Back in prison. And so basically, this was used to keep them away. But despite all that, it didn't keep the believers in Thessalonica from boldly proclaiming the gospel. Because again, in 1 Thessalonians 1, we already looked at it, but it's just marvelous. It says in verse 7, so that you are in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith in God Lord is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. And so despite trying to stop Paul and Silas, thankfully, these new converts couldn't keep the message to themselves. <clears throat> Last night, I had the joy of speaking about a man uh, called Daniel Wilson. He was kind of one of these church history sketches that I do from time to time. And uh, he, uh, he grew up uh, in a family that had uh, been generationally affected by revival. His maternal grandmother, uh, sorry, maternal grandfather, was <clears throat> was a, a best friend of George Whitfield mm -hmm. and a trustee of Whitfield. Uh, his his entire family were evangelical to the core, 
And this guy grew up surrounded by the gospel and had no interest in it. In fact, he said, I loved my sin so much, I didn't want to give it up for anybody. Isn't that sad? But eventually, somebody, uh, and you know what he was hiding behind? He was hiding behind Calvinism. What he said was, if God wants to save me, he will do it, whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. And so he used that as an excuse for his unbelief and rebellion. He said, God wants to save me, he can do it. Do it anytime he wants. All he has to do is turn on irresistible grace and I'm going to get saved if I'm one of the elect. End of story. So he, he hid behind that until one day somebody said, you know, God didn't only choose the end, he also chose the means. And the means is, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus. And it shook him to the core. For 18 months, he was under deep conviction. And finally, he found his rest in the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And immediately, just like the Thessalonians, he wrote to a man who had an influence on him. He was his tutor, who was a believer. And he said, I want to tell the whole world about Jesus. That was his first flush feelings after he'd been saved. I want to tell the whole world about Jesus. In fact, I even want to give myself as a missionary. He ended up, 35 years later, the Lord would take him at 54 years of age to India to serve the Lord there. Amazing. But he, right at the very beginning, he had that passion to share the gospel with others. And I think we were all there at one time. When we first got saved, we just wanted everybody to know. But you know what happens? We lose that first love, don't we? And we find it more difficult. Oh, how we need to get it back. These Thessalonians, they just told everybody about the Lord Jesus. And may the Lord help us to be like that. Now, we don't have time to compare with Berea, <laughs> which is what we tried out to start out to do, but we, Lord willing, will do that next time. Other than to say that they were much more, the Jews in Berea were much more receptive than those in Thessalonica. They, their soil was soft and prepared and ready for the word of God. Lord, help our hearts, even this morning, to have a softness and a tenderness toward the word of God and not resist it. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. It's so easy to harden your hearts, isn't it? And be soft and tender toward the word of God. Lord, may you find fertile soil in our lives for the good seed of your word. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the labors of Paul and Silas that we've been reading about. And we're thankful for the glad tidings, the gospel of the grace of God, that really does turn the world upside down. And Lord, we, we think back to those first days when we were saved and how we just wanted to tell everybody about the Lord Jesus. We were so thrilled at the Savior. Forgive us for, we have to confess and be honest, that sometimes a cold chill can come into our souls and we lose that, that brightness of, of eagerness to share the gospel with others. Lord, would you do, do a work in us as a company of your people to make us those that want to be like the Thessalonians so that from us could trumpet out the word of the Lord in surrounding areas and many people would come to faith in Christ. Lord, we look to thee to help us with these things. Thank you for those that do give hospitality to the saints, and to visiting laborers, to others that open their homes for the gospel of Christ. Lord, help us to reevaluate the use of our homes. Do we have a bigger purpose than just our own little nest? Lord, we know that you blessed us with things, but you bless us with a purpose, with reason. Help us, Lord, to think through these things to examine ourselves thoroughly in these matters. Lord, if we need to make adjustments, Lord, give us that willingness to change 
at thy command. We will give thee the glory and praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.